So in this chapter, we're going to hit up all of the main gram-positive bacilli-shaped bacteria that are going to most commonly cause human disease. So we already went through in chapter 18 the cocci-shaped bacteria, the gram-positive and the gram-negatives, the top one that caused human disease. Now we're going to look specifically at gram-positive and just the bacilli-shaped ones. So some ways to kind of group apart. So this might look a little familiar from the last PowerPoint that yes, gram-positive cocci, once we gram stain, we had various tests like catalase tests and coagulase tests to help narrow them down. Well, gram-positive bacilli, gram-positive rod-shaped bacteria, we group into kind of three general groups. One that make endospores, and yes, there's one that doesn't, but of the ones that don't make endospores, we're going to look at some of the different shapes of the bacteria and how they, you know, whether they, you know, like if they're a regular shaped or not, and if they have any other staining properties that we're going to talk about. So in your book, I like this little flow chart. Again, it's, you know, they're all gram positive rods or bacilli. Some make endospores, some don't make endospores. Of the endospores, we look at oxygen concentration or the requirement. And so those bacillus and clostridium are our big endospore bacteria. Of the non-endospores, we kind of start to look at some of their staining properties and their shapes. And then from there, we can break it apart looking at some of the different tests. So we're going to look first at our gram-positive endospore forming bacilli. So endospores, this is that survival unit that when these bacteria are not happy, they are too hot, too cold, too dry, too wet, there's too much radiation, who knows, whatever it is. These are bacteria that can go into an endospore state. Pretty much they can go dormant until conditions become favorable again. And anything in the bacillus and clostridium genus, these are the bacteria that can do that. It is a great way, it is a great survival method if they can make endospores. Now again, anything that's good for the bacteria is not good for us. So anything they've can make an endospore is gonna be harder to kill because you can't just kill them as easy with heat and with UV light and with different types of chemicals. So we're gonna start. There are two genus, bacillus and clostridium. We're gonna start with the bacillus bacteria. These are all, again, all endospore making. So anything in the genus Bacillus, these are aerobic bacteria. They do make the enzyme catalase, just like some of our staph, but totally different shape. They actually are a source of some of our antibiotics. We can actually get some antibiotics from this particular bacteria because they can inhibit other bacteria. But a lot of the Bacillus are found in soil. Now there are two species of medical importance, so they're the ones we talk about. The first one is Bacillus anthracis, which causes the disease anthrax. The other is Bacillus cereus, which is a type of food poisoning. Lots of different bacteria can cause food poisoning. We're going to focus mostly on the Bacillus anthracis. So shape-wise, they're kind of large, almost block-shaped rods, and they really like to hang out in chains. They're actually quite pretty. They like to hang out in nice long chains. Sometimes we can actually see the ones that have gone into an endospore state versus ones that are still active. And they, Bacillus anthracis has virulence factors, as a lot of the bacteria do, is that it, one, has a capsule, so it's harder for our, our body to recognize it, and it makes toxins that can cause edema and cell death, which is never good for us. Now, luckily here in the United States, we don't see a lot of cases of anthrax. It's pretty rare. Most of the cases are coming from livestock. So this is a bacteria that more than likely gets picked up by working with infected animals. And most cases are in Africa, Asia, and the Middle East. Now, there are three types of anthrax, and it's because you can pick up anthrax, this particular bacteria, in one of three ways. You can either pick it up through contact, through skin, you can pick it up by breathing it in, pulmonary, and you can pick it up by eating the bacteria, gastrointestinal. So depending on how you picked it up depends on which kind of anthrax you have. The most common, and luckily the least dangerous, is the cutaneous anthrax, is that those spores, those endospores, get into the skin through some open source, again, playing in the dirt, playing anywhere there might be infected soil, possibly if you live on a farm and have livestock that also may have tested positive, 
and the bacteria, they get in there, and again, they do have toxins that can cause skin death or cell death, and it can cause these black sores called eschars. Now, luckily it is the least dangerous type of anthrax. You end up just having localized death of tissues, these eschars, localized death of tissue at the infection sites. Pulmonary is where we inhale those endospores from some type of animal product or soil. So it gets dusty and those spores go airborne and you inhale it. This can become more deadly, again rarer, but more deadly is because this particular bacteria then can destroy lung tissue. And if it doesn't destroys enough of it, it becomes deadly. Gastrointestinal is you ate contaminated food. It had this bacteria, whether it was contaminated because it was dirty, but you had contaminated it, and yes, those toxins are going to destroy you literally from the inside out. And so it is very deadly, but also very rare. I think there's one, maybe two cases a year in the whole world. Now, controlling it and treating it, it is treatable. Antibiotics can be given, uh, even preventative. If you thought you might have been exposed to this particular bacteria, you can be given prophylactic antibiotics. If you know you've been exposed, they might also give you antibodies that are going to bind up the toxins to prevent it from getting into cells and destruction. Um, one of the most common antibiotics given is the ciproflax, flaxacin, but we've got multiple antibiotics that can be given. We also, because they are found predominantly in livestock, we do vaccinate livestock. So that reduces the chance. If the animals don't have it, you have a less of a chance of getting it. Otherwise, we do have a uh, we do have a vaccine. It's not given to anyone. It's a purified toxoid vaccine. It's usually just given those that are at high risk occupations. So those that might be digging in dirts, that might be testing for this particular bacteria, maybe those that are doing the testing. So those that are just at high risk occupation, military personnel, this is a bacteria. You may have heard of anthrax because it is a bacteria that can be used as bioterrorism because it can be deadly if eaten or if breathed in. Treatable if you think you've been exposed to it, but if you didn't know you were exposed to it and didn't get treated, it can be deadly. And so military personnel can get vaccinated for it. Um, otherwise, Mike, you got to be given the booster shots every few, you know, every year, year and a half, though. So it's one of those if you really, truly are at risk or in a high risk area, you're given constant booster shots for this. But it's treatable. Also, if there's any livestock that are infected uh, when they do die or if they die, if they are killed because of their infection, to make sure they're treated so that the spores that are in that animal don't end up in the soil and start all over again. The other bacillus, it is less common for causing disease. When I say less common for causing disease, it doesn't cause deadly disease all that often. It is a bacteria, we find it in the air, we find it in the dust, so it's usually picked up through uh, breathing it in or if it gets on food sources, it can survive cooking and reheating. Again, it's an endospore bacteria, it can survive boiling temperatures. And the toxin that it contains normally gives you your basic food poisoning treatments or your food poisoning symptoms. No big treatments for it. The bacteria leaves with the diarrhea and the vomiting. So it's generally just replace fluids and electrolytes and it will leave on its own. Otherwise, the other genus of bacteria that can make endospore is the clostridium. There's a few more that can cause serious issues in the clostridium versus the bacillus genus. So they are all spore forming rods. They usually don't hang out in chains like the bacillus. We can see the spore in some of them. They, I don't know, they always think they kind of look like a little magnifying glass if they've got a spore. They're anaerobic. They don't make the enzyme catalase. Uh, there are lots of species of them. We're gonna talk about the top four that cause human disease, but they can make various types of acids, alcohols, toxins, and depending where they get in the body and depending which clostridium it is, they can cause wound infections, tissue infections, food intoxications. They can cause some serious, if not deadly, issues. So the first clostridium we're going to talk about is called Clostridium perfringens, and it can cause a disorder or disease called gas gangrene or myonecrosis. It's the most frequent clostridia that gets into tissues. So this bacteria is found in soil, it's found in human skin, it's found in the intestine, and it can be found in the vagina. 
So it's lots of places this could be part of normal flora. However, this is a bacteria if it gets into an open wound and it gets down deep enough into the anaerobic area because this is an anaerobic organism. So it's got to get down underneath the skin into those anaerobic areas. It will start to grow. It's very happy there. So the big predisposing factors is if you have though any kind of open wounds, surgical incisions, fractures, um, diabetic ulcers, any type of septic abortion, puncture wounds, gunshot wounds, any anything that you've got an open wound that wasn't cleaned properly. This, this bacteria has toxins that destroys red blood cells, it destroys tissues, it breaks apart collagen, it breaks apart cells, that's the hyaluronidase, um, and it breaks apart DNA. It allows the bacteria to move freely around the tissue as it breaks it apart. Now, it is causing death of tissues. That's the necrosis. Myo means muscle. And so this will destroy not just skin, but it can destroy all the way down into muscle tissue. Now, it does produce a very noxious gas as it is eating away at your tissue. I got more pictures. As it's eating away at your tissue, that it's also called gas gangrene. Now, if you've ever had a patient, because I have had students that have had patients before that have had this bacteria, it is a very smelly, smelly gas. So it's very, very stinky. I mean, it is death of tissue, very noxious gas that this bacteria is given off. So this is actually showing some of the bacteria in and breaking apart the muscle fibers. Now, there are two forms of gas gangrene. Uh, some of it just damages the muscle tissue, but the infection remains localized. A true myonecrosis is more destructive and it will spread. It's not just going to be, you know, it's not just going to be one toe and it stays put. It's going to start spreading to different parts of the body. That's a true myonecrosis. So it's going to be more similar to that necrotizing fasciitis, that flesh eating disease, that it's truly eating apart the flesh. Now, you know, Mike, other than causing gas gangrene and causing death of tissue, Clostridium perfringens can also cause what's known as Clostridial gastroenteritis. Gastro means stomach, entero, there it is again, entero means intestines, and so this is going to cause more food poisoning type symptoms. So if you in ate anything that had this particular food, you know, you went to a picnic and that food sat out in a nice hot day and you ate some of the food because the warmer it is, the more the bacteria is reproducing in that food. And you ate that food. It wasn't cooked thoroughly. The bacteria were growing. Those bacteria are going to continue They're to try to grow in your body. They're going to germinate. They're going to multiply. And the toxin and the bacteria that you ate is going to act on the stomach and cause you to have abdominal pain, diarrhea, and nausea. Luckily, most people recover just fine as your food poisoning type symptoms. Now, treatment to pre and prevention of this particular bacteria. Well, one, if it's food, you know, make sure food's cooked properly. Don't eat the stuff that's been sitting on a table at a picnic on a hot day for four hours. Don't do it. Don't uh, but if you've got full tissue damage, you're going to have to clean that dirty wound. You've got to get rid of any living tissue as much as you can. Uh, you've got to, it's called debridement of t disease tissue that is surgically removing any of that dead necros tissue, large doses of antibiotics. It might require the hyperbaric oxygen therapy to have that tissue repair because right now we don't have any vaccine. So it is cleaning, it is antibiotics, and it is surgical removal of infected tissue. Now, our next clostridium is clostridium tetani, and it causes the disease called tetanus, more often nicknamed as lockjaw. It is a neuromuscular disease. It affects the nervous system, which then affects the muscular system. Now, this particular bacteria is found in soil and in intestinal tracts. Everyone always thinks, ah, I get tetanus from a rusty nail. Always. Uh, nope, not always. Uh, the big thing is, it's a clostridium. It does need an anaerobic environment. And so if you cut yourself on anything deep enough, 
you could get any bacteria that was on that surface that you cut yourself on down into that anaerobic area of your skin. However, a rusty nail, usually or rusty anything, generally implies that that object is dirty. It's been sitting out in the environment rusting, which means it probably does have dust or soil on it. It might have fecal material from animals on it. So I get we're rusty nail, but any cut, uh, a, a big group of individuals, you, anyone that farms that might get cut, big risk for the bacteria. Uh, anyone that even has, uh, I'm trying to think of the, like roses and does a lot of rose planting, well, you get scratches all the time. If it's a deep enough scratch or cut, you're playing in soil and dirt, and again, you can get any kind of bacteria in those open wounds. So, most often the spores enter the wounds through some type of damage to the skin, and you've got that anaerobic environment that's going to allow them to grow and release their toxin. Now, how it causes what's known as lockjaw. So, it releases a toxin. And that toxin causes paralysis. It's paralysis of a certain nerve ending. So we have muscles, I always like to say, I'm like, for our nervous system controls our skeletal muscle. Now, anytime we want our muscle to contract, we have something that's going to stimulate our muscle to contract, and we have something that's going to inhibit the muscle from contracting. So we have something that can tell our muscle to contract, and we have something that can tell our muscle to relax. Well, this particular bacteria, the toxin, stops the inhibition. So there's nothing to tell the muscle to relax, which means the muscle will never relax. It will stay in a permanently contracted state. Now, your facial muscles are usually one of the first ones to start showing symptoms of this, which is why it's called lockjaw. The muscles in your cheeks, when they stay in a permanently contracted state, your muscle stays, your jaw stays closed. It's those cheek muscles that are opening and closing your mouth. Your mouth closes when they contract. It opens when they relax. Well, this toxin, it again, it blocks that inhibition of the contraction, meaning there's nothing to inhibit or there's nothing to stop the muscle contraction. It stays in a permanently contracted state. Um, I know I, I don't know if I want to go back. Ah, there we go. I know I had this on that first slide too. That yes, you could hold a baby. That whole baby's body is in a permanently contracted state. That yes, these muscles can contract strong enough. It's been known to break bones. That your muscle contraction breaks internal bones. Now, how it's deadly? Well, it affects skeletal muscles. And one of your most important skeletal muscles you have is your diaphragm which means your diaphragm can go into a permanently contracted state. And if your diaphragm can't contract and relax, you can't breathe, which means you're gonna die because you can't breathe. Now, treatment. For someone that's starting to show symptoms means you've probably had the bacteria for a little while, a few days, few weeks. Now, usually it starts to exhibit, there's muscle twitches and you start to get the muscle, con that more permanent muscle contraction in the face. At that point, you're going to be having, you're, you're going to need the antitoxin. You're going to be given antibodies to try to bind up the toxin. Now, it doesn't help with already ones that are already inhibiting. The hope is that your body can get rid of them on their own, but it can at least stop any additional toxins from binding. So it doesn't, the disease won't progress. They're also going to give you a whole bunch of antibiotics as well as muscle relactants. But normally those, by the time you're showing symptoms, it's usually too late. Now, yay, you can prevent it all together. We do have a vaccine for it. It's the DTaP vaccine. The DTaP vaccine is a vaccine. It's a multiple uh, vaccine because it treats both diphtheria, or not both, but three things, diphtheria, tetanus, and pertussis. And so it's the T of the DTaP or the T of the TDAP. And so I'm like, we can get vaccinated. It's pretty rare. There's not a lot of cases of tetanus. Here in, in La Crosse, I just heard about a case a year ago, two years ago, uh, that there was an Amish 
farmer that had come in. I don't know any more about age. I know it was a male, a male Amish farmer that had come in that was exhibiting those muscle spasms, the lockjaw. Again, a lot of the Amish, they're not getting vaccines. They're not getting booster shots regularly. And yeah, it, they're at a higher risk that they could have had any cut in with the soil and suffered from it. Now, the individual lived but was here in the hospital in La Crosse for, I think, several weeks. They had to put him into an induced coma. Um, I was surprised to hear that we don't keep this an the antibody, the antitoxin therapy here. Uh, it's so rare, it's, we wouldn't normally keep stockpiles of stuff that never gets used, but by putting them, you know, lots of antibiotics, muscle relactants, and putting them into an induced coma, he survived. But it's rare, but it can happen. And again, just get vaccinated and keep up with it and you don't have to worry about it. The next clostridium is the one that out of all the clostridium, most students are most familiar with because you hear about it, especially if you're already working in a healthcare job. So it's a clostridial disease. It's normally nicknamed C. diff. Again, you're not supposed to shorten the species name. And it's the second most common intestinal disease after salmonellosis. Now, it's caused by the bacteria Clostridium difficile, but I put my red note on here. They have changed the name of Clostridium difficile. There are lots of Clostridium bacteria. We're talking the top four. There's lots of Clostridium bacteria, so they started to try to sort them out and rename them. Now, it was supposed to get renamed like gastroclostridial disease or something like that. But everyone got really mad about that because if you would have named it gastro anything, it would no longer be called C. diff. But I think they said it would cost the medical industry, I don't know how many, mil it was millions of dollars to change all the paperwork so that everything went from C. diff to G. diff. And we don't like to spend a lot of money. So they compromised and it's now called Clostridioides difficile. So it still gets C. diff. Just note, this textbook came out a couple years ago. Even, I was gonna say, a couple other textbooks that I previewed don't have clostridioids quite yet. I expect it in the next editions. But just note, if you look up C. diff online, you're gonna start to see it called clostridioids. So just a heads up on that. Now, back to my C. diff is a normal resident of the intestine. For a lot of people, this is their normal flora bacteria. It is kept in check by your other normal flora bacteria. Now, if this bacteria grows uncontrolled, meaning you got rid of your normal flora for some reason, they do, this bacteria does produce toxins that damages the intestinal wall. It causes a condition called pseudomembranous colitis. It's inflammation of the intestinal wall lining. And it causes, you know, it's a not a top cause, it's a top cause, but not a number one cause, but it causes a lot of diarrhea in hospitals. Now, this is an antibiotic related colitis. So it's inflammation of the colon, that's colitis, but it's antibiotic related is because we actually pick it up by taking broad spectrum antibiotics. When you take a broad spectrum antibiotics, you kill the good bacteria that normally keep this one in check, which, means you have no bacteria to keep it in check. It's not killed by a broad spectrum antibiotic. And so it is gonna start to grow uncontrolled. Now, mild cases, you can just, you, well one, stop taking the antibiotics. You know, that's what's killing the good bacteria. Stop taking antibiotics, replace fluids and electrolytes. Usually they recommend, you know, yogurt, any kind of probiotics to try to get your good bacteria back. But it's one of the few things that the treatment for a bacterial infection is to stop the antibiotics. This is because we want to stop killing the good bacteria. Severe infections. So they're just not just going away by stopping and trying to get the good bacteria back and replacing fluids and electrolytes. We do have some stronger antibiotics. Sometimes they can have some more serious side effects. So we don't try to treat them unless we have to, but we can treat with vancomycin and metronidazole. Now this is showing kind of what a normal intestinal drag looks like on the inside versus pseudomembranous colitis. That is severe inflammation. It can cause ulcers in the colon. If you have an ulcer, I mean, you're now at a risk for even more infections. You can damage it enough that it could cause a full blown hole ulcer. 
in the, the colon. So it's going to be painful and it's going to cause severe irritation leading to extreme diarrhea. Now, our third clostridium is Clostridium botulinum. It causes the disease botulism. It's normally associated with a food poisoning. And so we normally pick it up. That's the number one way to pick it up is by eating contaminated food. And it's not just the bacteria that you eat that causes all the issues. It's the fact that this bacteria does make toxins. And when you eat something contaminated, you're eating the toxins which cause the damage. Now, this bacteria can be found on food, and if they are not cooked and canned properly, these bacteria will grow, and they will flourish, and then if you eat them, you're going to eat the toxins and the bacteria, suffering all the side effects. They do love a good anaerobic condition. Now, it's the toxin that's deadly. It's always the toxins that's deadly. Now, why the toxin is deadly? This is also a neuromuscular disorder, like tetanus is. Tetanus inhibits muscle relaxation, which means it has a permanently contracted state. The botulism or botulinum toxin works a little different. So here's my quick rundown, my 30 second, if not less, review of how a skeletal muscle contracts. There's your axon, axon terminal, zooming in on the axon terminal here, when an action potential, thought you'd never have to hear about action potentials again. When an action potential travels down the axon terminal, it causes acetylcholine to get released, to cross the synaptic cleft, to interact with the muscle cell membrane, causes some calcium channels to open, and the skeletal muscle ultimately contracts. See, quick little review there. However, this particular toxin covers or stops the it covers the end of that axon terminal and blocks acetylcholine from getting released which means you could tell your muscle to contract but if acetylcholine can't cross the synaptic cleft and make it to your skeletal muscle this skeletal muscle is not going to contract now you have a very important skeletal muscle your diaphragm and if your diaphragm cannot contract you're going to die it's a deadly toxin, is because it causes your skeletal muscles to stop contracting. Now, some of the initial symptoms, double or blurred vision, difficulty swallowing, that's all muscles, and it's gonna be anything that might be caused from neurological damage, anything that affects the skeletal muscles. You might have muscle twitching, you might just feel almost, you know, you can't control your muscles, because you can't. Now, another picture again showing the end of that axon terminal, the acetylcholine getting released. However, if that toxin is present, acetylcholine can't get released and your skeletal muscle can't contract. Now, infant botulism is anytime an infant eats the bacteria itself. You guys, as adults, can ingest some of the bacteria itself. It's only if you ingest large quantities of the bacteria, more of the toxin, that you're gonna suffer the deadly side effects. However, infants, they don't have a strong immune system and they don't have a strong digestive system with all the normal flora yet. So they, if they ingest any bacterial spores whatsoever, those bacteria are gonna grow in their intestinal tract and release the toxin. Now, Botulism is not a super common bacterial infection, and so infants picking it up, it's more serious. There's about 90 cases a year of infant botulism. One of the number one ways that infants can pick it up is honey. Honey itself is antibacterial. Endospore, this bacteria can be in honey. It's not gonna grow. It's gonna stay in an endospore state. And again, you guys can eat honey just fine. You guys could eat some of this bacteria just fine. Your immune system can get rid of it in small quantities. And infants cannot. And so it can be deadly for infants. So if you ever wondered why on the back of your honey container it says, don't give honey to infants under the age of two, it's because there could be some botulism in there, the bacteria, and in a mic, it could cause serious issues for them. Generally not for you. 
The bacteria can also get into open wounds. Again, it's not super common and it's getting more common now that we're starting to have uh, increase of drug needles. Again, the drug needles can be putting the bacteria into an anaerobic environment. An, an anaerobic environment. It gets in the body, they grow, they can travel, and it usually causes more food poisoning symptoms. Now, because this is a bacteria that can survive, it's an endospore, that can survive boiling temperatures. Let's go back to some of my pictures. One of the number one ways that people pick it up is improperly canned foods. Now, I can some stuff. I'm trying. Now, there's a couple different ways you can can foods. You can boil canned things and you can pressure canned things. Now, this bacteria can survive boiling temperatures. So your boil canning won't kill it. However, if your food is acidic, which a lot of fruits already have a natural acid in them, and for other foods they have you add lemon juice, which is acidic, the acid plus boiling will kill endospores. It's the acid part with the boiling. However, vegetables and meats, which are not acidic, have to be pressure cooked because they don't have the acid. And so like they need the extra pressure to increase the temperature to kill them. So improperly canned foods are one of the top ways that people pick up Clostridium botulinum. Now, random factoid when I get to this picture, you know, it says, honey, let's lay off the Botox for a while. Eh, you'll see commercials now, Botox, because I've seen them. But if you ever wondered what Botox stands for, it's short for botulism toxin. That's exactly what Botox stands for. Botulism toxin, we've already said, it stops muscles from contracting. Your skeletal muscles can't contract, which yeah, can be deadly if it's the, the respiratory system and your diaphragm. However, if you inject the toxin in small doses right underneath your skin, your skeletal muscles in your face can't contract. And when you are constantly moving your skeletal muscles in your face, it does cause your skin to wrinkle up, hence wrinkles. So we use Botox, <laughs> you pretty much are freezing your face. So you can't move your face, but then you don't have the wrinkles either. I don't know which you want, if to look like a statue or, you know, and not have wrinkles or just have wrinkles. Uh, but if, yeah, if you ever wondered, in theory, where the Botox came from, in theory, the toxin should stay put, but if you ever listen to the commercials, because you will now, to Botox, and then they have all the side effects that they list, and if you have difficulty swallowing or breathing, see a professional. Yeah, it means it's spreading and it could kill you. Now, people that are suffering from botulism, they're normally, they're going to give you an antitoxin. They want to bind up the toxin so that everything can work properly. Depending on how severe it is, they might have to put you on some type of cardiac or respiratory support because you can't breathe on your own. Otherwise, you know, they're going to give you some type of antibiotic. Penicillin works pretty well. Otherwise, your best prevention is make sure foods are preserved and canned properly, making sure preservatives are added if needed. Then you don't have to worry about it. Now, the action of the botulism or botulinum toxin is always on that neuromuscular junction, preventing that acetylcholine from getting released. Now we're going to work on our other side. It's a little shorter side, though. It looks longer. Uh, but we're going to look at some of our gram-positive rods that don't make endospores. Now, my mycoplasma, I moved on to the different chapter, so we're going to talk about it um, in a different chapter. But of our gram-positive, not endospore bacilli, our first one we're going to talk about is listeria. And this one has a uniform shape, which means it doesn't have a pleomorphic. Pleomorphic means it varies in size and shape. Listeria, they're all pretty uniform in shape. Now, of all the listeria, there's really only one that causes serious issues with humans, and it's the listeria monocytogenes. Now, its shape, it's usually a coxobacilli shape, so it's still a bacilli, but it's usually a little more short bacilli. A few of them can have some long filaments to it. But the interesting part about it, it's resistant to cold. Most bacteria don't grow very well in cold environments. This one will grow just fine in your refrigerator and even in your freezer. 
It's also resistant to heat, salt, different types of pH extremes, and even bile. So it takes a lot to kill this particular bacteria. Now, this is a bacteria, one of its coolest for it, not us, virulence factors is that it can actually grow inside of our phagocytes. So this is one of our phagocytes, which a phagocyte's job is to eat bacteria and then break them down. Well, this phagocyte is eating this bacteria, but this bacteria has figured out how not to get broken down. And so it hides in the best place ever, our own immune system cells, and it reproduces and then starts to go out to other different cells in the body. Now, places we find this particular bacteria, we can find it in soil, we can find it in water, we can find it in animal intestines. Uh, most of the time we pick it up by eating or drinking contaminated foods. Again, if they haven't been properly refrigerated, they but it can survive in the refrigerator, if they haven't been properly pasteurized, if they haven't been cooked you know, long enough. Now, if you pick up this bacteria, you suffer from listeriosis. Now, the top foods and drinks is usually dairy products, poultry, and meat. It's not the only ones, but they're the top ones. Now, listeriosis, your initial symptoms, you're gonna have a fever, you're gonna have diarrhea, and usually a sore throat. Those seem to be the top ones. Those are all things that indicate that your immune system is recognizing that there is something foreign in the body and it's, you know, trying to get rid of it. Now, for normal adults, meaning normal immune system, usually the symptoms are pretty mild or even subclinical. However, this is a bacteria in immunocompromised patients, in elderly, and even in fetuses that can cause deadly issues. This is one of the few bacteria that can cross the placental barrier. So for pregnant women, this is a big issue that mom with a normal immune system will be just fine However, this bacteria can cross that placental barrier and it can cause uh, meningitis in infants, which is, can be very deadly. It has a 20% death rate in immunocompromised elderly and fetuses. Now, diagnosing it, it's slow to grow. Again, usually they need a cold enrichment process. And so we don't generally just try to grow it out because that would take too long to diagnose. But we do have other quicker tests. We can do ELISA's looking for various antigens or even antibodies. We can do an immunofluorescence test. We can make the thing glow. Or we can do some type of PCR and look for the DNA. It's treatable. We do have antibiotics to treat it, but the best bet is to just not get it in the first place. Make sure all drinks are pasture pasteurized properly making sure all food is cooked properly. And then for pregnant women, there's a reason why they say avoid certain foods during pregnancy. Those are foods that are at a higher risk of having this bacteria. So I found this little diagram that sprouts soft cheeses, like mozzarella is a soft cheese compared to a harder cheddar cheese, uh, raw milk, smoked seafood, deli meats and hot dogs um, are all higher risk foods. Now, on to our last little group here. I switched it around a little bit um, on my diagram because I took out the mycoplasm. These are all pleomorphic. So they don't make endospores. They're still gram-positive rods. They don't make an endospore, and they're all pleomorphic shape, which means they don't have a perfect uniform shape. And there's three medically important genera, the Carinibacterium, Propionibacterium, and Mycobacterium. So the Carinibacterium, of all the Carinibacterium, there's only one main one that causes issues, issues for us. It's the Carinibacterium diphtheriae, which causes the disease diphtheria. Now, there are a lot of individuals that are carriers of this particular bacteria. However, if you're a carrier, you are at higher risk of picking it up. But most cases that develop the diphtheria disease are usually non-immunized children in usually more crowded, unsanitary conditions. It is spread through respiratory droplets from carriers or even or infected individuals. And there are two stages of the disease. There's a localized infection and one where the toxins are spreading. 
So a localized infection by this bacteria is generally going to cause upper respiratory tract inflammation. So you're going to have a sore throat, nausea, vomiting, swollen lymph nodes. You can also develop something known as a pseudomembrane. Now a pseudomembrane is this large growth at the back of the throat. Now if it grows large enough, it can actually block the whole airway and it can cause asphyxiation, meaning you're not going to get enough oxygen. Now, it can also, depending on how it gets in the body, it might cause something known as cutaneous diphtheria, which means as you're fighting one thing, you can get something else. And it can cause damage to your skin. Now, if it starts to travel throughout the body, the toxin itself, it can cause toxemia, meaning this toxin is going to start to damage usually the heart and various nerves and can be deadly. Most often, it's not a very common bacteria. Just note these are the most common bacteria that we talk about that affect humans, but it's not that common of a bacteria these days. Uh, and normally, it's going to cause more of the local infection. It's rare, severely immunocompromised. It starts to travel throughout the body. Now, this is one of those cu the cutaneous diphtheria that you can start to get secondary infections on your skin. Now, diagnosing for Carinibacterium, one, they can look for that pseudomembrane, that growth at the back of the throat. We can look and see the swelling. We can do gram stains. We can try to look for the gram-positive rod that's pleomorphic, no endospore. We can, you know, determine are, does the patient have any particular conditions, any history where they've been anywhere, where this particular bacteria might be. And they can do various types of immune system tests. They can do ELISAs. They can do even PCR tests if they need to. Now, treatment, they would give you an antitoxin. So they would give you the antibodies against the toxin. They would then give you some type of antibiotic as well. So let's kill the bacteria. Let's, you know, neutralize the toxin. But it is a preventable bacteria. We do have a toxoid vaccine. So it's going to stimulate your body to recognize the toxin and act against it before it does any damage. And it is the D in your DTAP vaccine or TDAP. So again, your DTAP vaccine is diphtheria, tetanus, which both we talked about in this PowerPoint, and pertussis, which gets talked about later. Not in this PowerPoint. The next genus that's pleomorphic, it doesn't have a perfect shape to it, is the Propiani bacterium. Now, Propiani bacterium acnes is the most common of all the Propiani bacteria, and this is the one, if you've ever had acne, is the bacteria you can blame for it. On occasion, it can cause some eye infections or it can cause an infections in artificial joints, but generally the worst thing you gotta worry about with Propiani bacterium is acne. Now, quick little concept check up until this point. Carini bacterium causes a pseudomembrane and upper respiratory distress and can be prevented with a vaccine. All true. Now, our last group on here is the mycobacterium. And anything in the mycobacterium genus, they all are acid fast bacterium. They all make myco mycolic acid, which is a lipid in their cell walls, which means we can't gram stain them accurately because it's a lipid and our the stains in a gram stain are water-based. They are gram positive. We do know that. They do have a thick cell wall, but we have to do a special staining procedure called an acid fast stain that's looking specifically for mycolic acid. They are strict aerobes. They do produce the enzyme catalase. They don't have any capsules or flagella or make endospores. And they are really slow to grow. So they can even take several months in a lab before we see these on a plate. Now, one of the most common mycobacteria out there is Mycobacterium tuberculosis. So, kind of where we find it. Mycobacterium tuberculosis, those that are at highest risk for picking it up, um, anyone that has a weaker immune system. Maybe it's due to nutrition, some type of poor access to medical care, lung damage, genetics, whatever it is. But about a third of the world's population, and that includes around 15 million here in the United States, carry this particular bacteria. Yay! 
it means you guys might be carrying it now means it's out there because you guys if you go into the medical field all have to have a tb it's tuberculosis test and i'm like you may have been exposed to someone that's carried this particular bacteria now the bacteria itself is very resistant and it's transmitted by respiratory droplets so someone coughing sneezing on you and coughing is a one of the symptoms now about five to ten percent of infected people develop the clinical disease which means you might have had a mild cough or, and never even realized your body was trying to get rid of this bacteria. You might not have had any symptoms whatsoever. Now, if left untreated, the disease progresses slowly. Again, it's a very slow growing bacteria. Now, clinical tuberculosis means you've got it bad enough you would go to the clinic. It is divided into three phases. The primary tuberculosis, secondary tuberculosis, sometimes called reactivated or reinfection, and disseminated tuberculosis, meaning it's leaving the lungs. Most often the disease stays in the lungs, rare that it leaves. Which I'm like, I'm gonna put it down here. Nope, I'll leave it, same picture over here. Now, the initial infection. So it can take just 10 cells to get in the body. It's a pretty small infectious dose. Well, when it gets in the body, our immune system recognizes it, and it's going to get eaten. It's going to get phagocytized by some of our macrophages. However, it doesn't get broken down like it should, and so it will start to reproduce in there. Now, as you start to get enough of these infected white blood cells, they start to conjoin together and form something called a tubercle. Now, if you get enough of them together, these are still cells, white blood cells, infected cells, those inner or initial white blood cells will start to die. And so the center of the tubercle starts to break down. So if these are all the infected cells, the center starts to break down. Now, here's, I'm going to go, here's, you know, your big, huge tubercle, and it starts to break down. This is when we start getting, you know, if it starts to break apart and spread, we get into secondary or reactivated tuberculosis. It's when it's going to start to spread to other parts of our lungs. So if the patient doesn't recover from primary tuberculosis by having all those tubercles in there, that yes, some of these bacteria can start to spread from different parts of the lung to other parts or to different parts of the body. Then you generally are going to have, as you start you're starting to destroy a lung tissue, more severe signs and symptoms. Violent coughing, greenish or bloody sputum. Some of these are getting into blood vessels and damaging blood vessels. Fever, anorexia, weight loss, fatigue. I mean, your body is under attack. That's exhausting. Now, if still left untreated, it has a 60% mortality rate. I'm like, that's not great. Well, hopefully somewhere in all of this, you would go in and start to get treated. But just like it's slow to grow, it's slow to kill. It takes a lot of antibiotics, usually combination for months to get rid of it. So how do we detect if you've got TB? Well, some of you may have actually had the first test. It's the tuberculin sensitivity skin test or the Mantau test. So what they do, because again, you might have had this done and you had no idea what was happening, is they take a purified protein derivative. They actually take a small protein that comes directly from this bacteria. We shorten it, purified protein derivative, PPD, and they inject it into your skin. So there's that injection of that protein underneath the skin. And right away, you probably saw a little tiny bump form. And you're like, oh, that's interesting. Is that normal? Totally normal. Well, we're going to take a look, 48 to 72 hours, to look to see what your immune system does to that protein. Does it recognize it? Do you have antibodies that recognize that particular protein? And if you do have antibodies that recognize that particular protein, you're going to have an immune system reaction that's going to happen right there is your antibodies are like, holy cow, we are under attack. You're not, it's just a protein. But they don't know that, and they're gonna be under attack. And you're gonna see, this is if you have antibodies, you're gonna see an immune reaction that's gonna happen right there. So they're gonna look to see what does that 
little bulge look like 48 to 72 hours? My guess is yours probably just look like this. It probably flattened out. It went away. It looks like nothing. However, this would be a positive skin test. So they're going to look to see, you know, you know, what is, you know, your size, your weight, your age, and then look to see your reaction. Now, other ways to detect. My note on this for the test, if you've ever had a positive, because I've had students that it's come back positive, it does not mean you have an active case of tuberculosis. You could. However, if you've ever been exposed to anyone that's had tuberculosis, and again, a lot of people are asymptomatic, if you've ever been exposed to this particular bacteria, you would have antibodies. And so you would have a reaction. If you had a reaction, you either, one, have an active TB infection, unbeknownst to you, or it just means you've been exposed to someone that's had it at some point in the past. Who knows? Five years ago. But if you end up with a positive skin test to rule out that you don't have an active infection, they kind of move on to one of these next tests. And so there's a couple different blood tests they can do to look for the bacteria. They might do a chest x-ray looking for active tu the tubercles. They might do an acid fasting on your sputum. So they're going to take a sputum sample coming from the lungs and they're going to do an acid fasting looking for the bacteria. Or they can try to take a sputum sample and grow up any bacteria that might be in your sputum looking for this particular bacteria. So the first and the easiest is that quick little skin test, but depending on how that ends up for your reaction, they move on to one of these other tests. Now again, it's hard to treat. Six to 24 months of at least two antibiotic drugs uh, from a list of 11 that work against this bacteria. And mycobacterium tuberculosis is getting more and more resistant to the antibiotics every day. We there is a vaccine out there. Um, other countries are using it. It seems to run into a lot of risk factors, requires boosters, and so it's not commonly given here in the United States. Um, it's still not really commonly given in other countries, but we do have a vaccine out there. Again, if you know you're at high risk, and I'm like, it might be more likely to be given. Now, my last concept check on here, tuberculosis, actually I got one more. Tuberculosis is spread via respiratory droplets. Again, it does trigger coughing, so it allows the bacteria to go from one person to another. Another mycobacterium, so tuberculosis, most common tuberculosis, but there's another one too you may have heard of, is mycobacterium lepri. It causes leprosy. It's also known as Hansen's bacillus or Hansen's disease. Now, this is a really picky bacteria to grow. We haven't ourselves been able to grow it in a lab on any kind of media or tissue. The interesting part about it is this bacteria likes lower than body temperature. It grows best around 30, 35 degrees Celsius, whereas your body temperature is 37. So it normally targets extremities where it is the coldest, your fingertips, your nose, the tip of your nose, so the colder regions of your body. Really slow to grow. Um, another random factoid is armadillos have the perfect temperature to grow, body temperature to grow this bacteria, so we've been known to grow this bacteria in armadillos. It is an intracellular bacteria, so it itself can also hide inside of our own cells and grow and cause disease. But as it starts to break apart cells and cause damage to cells, it causes that disease called leprosy. Now, it does start in the skin and the mucous membranes and then eventually progresses into nerves, which then it can be deadly. Now, the bacteria itself, it can be found throughout the world. We're not always sure how it's spread. It seems to be spread only with those in close quarters. So are in close contact with each other, whether it's only respiratory droplets or it has to be some type of skin-to-skin -skin contact. It's not been fully verified. I don't think anyone wants to sign up for that project. So it's not highly virulent. Again, it doesn't spread all that often. It seems to be a high dose that's needed to get it. And even once you do get it, it's still slow to grow. And its incubation period is two to five years before you might even see symptoms. 
Now, if left untreated, again, it targets the skin first, and it's normally where you're gonna start to see some damage of your skin. Eventually, it's gonna target the Schwann cells of your nervous system, and you're gonna have nerve system damage. And so later on, again, you just might start to see that there's just tissue damage or, you know, like just some type of tissue abnormality going on. But yes, eventually, you might actually start to lose appendages. Now, diagnosing it, sometimes it's symptomatic. Sometimes we can look under the microscope at some of the lesions looking for the bacteria. Otherwise, some of the symptoms is numbness in your hands and feet, loss of heat and cold sensitivity. Again, you've got damage to your nerve endings, muscle weakness, thickened earlobes, a chronic stuffy nose. But again, we're looking to do a diagnos yeah, diagnosis. You're gonna look for those acid fast bacteria in either the skin lesions or nasal discharges or any type of infected tissue sample. Treating it, well, kind of like tuberculosis, it is a mycobacterium, long-term combined antibiotic therapy. So prevention is we're just always looking at high-risk populations. We're looking to see if there's outbreaks, are those people interacting with large quantities of people? We don't have a vaccine yet, but right now it almost looks like the vaccine for tuberculosis may provide some protection against this. They are both a clostridium. It's still in trials. Now, my last mycobacterium is mycobacterium avian complex. So this is a bacterium, the mycobacterium avian complex, that seems to affect those that have really no working immune system anymore. Those that have progressed, they have an HIV that has progressed into the AIDS stage of HIV. And this particular bacterium, bacteria is very deadly for those that have AIDS. It's the third most common cause of death in AIDS patients. Uh, so unless you have no working immune system, it's not a bacterium that generally affects you. But the the HIV virus is out there, and so this is another bacteria they have to worry about. And the, I guess the last, last bacterium, mycobacterium, the Kansasi. Again, it's rare. It's a non-tuberculosis lung disease, so it does cause pulmonary infections. Usually just in adult white males, it seems to be a genetic disposition, and only those that already have pre-existing emphysema or bronchitis still pretty rare. I don't see a lot of cases of it or I've heard of a lot of cases of it. Now my last concept check. Um, which of the following mycobacilli is responsible for the third most common cause of death in AIDS patients? Well it's the one I just mentioned before, the mycobacterium avium complex. So we got through all the gram positives. We're done with all gram positive bacteria. We got through all the gram positive cocci in the last chapter, as well as some of the cocci negative. And we got through all the gram positive bacilli. So we're done with gram positive bacteria.